Have you ever wondered, is that God speaking to me? Have you ever wondered, is God really saying this to me? Have you ever wondered, is this what God wants me to do? Have you ever said, I want to do what God wants me to do, but everything within me says I shouldn't do this, but yet that's what you desire personally. So today we're talking about hearing God's voice. It may not be verbal. It could be the inclination. It could be the thought. It could be the compulsion that you have within your life. Today, many of you are saying, I want to do what God wants me to do. I just don't know what he wants me to do. And sometimes, so often, we feel like God says one thing, but yet I want this thing, or we hear this voice and this voice, and sometimes I'm confused on which voice to listen to. The idea that we have is we can fall on our knees before God, we can pray to God, and that's a one-way communication to God, but we never hear from God. We don't know what God wants for us. We don't have the passion to hear from God. So today, today what I want you to hear is how can I know that what I feel and what I desire is from God and not from mom or not from dad or not from the church, but from God. See, all those things are good. All those, mom wants to do good. Dad wants you to do good. Grandparents want you to do good. Your church wants you to do good. But what I need what I have to have, I have to know, is that what God wants? Because I can try to please everybody and I can be miserable. But when I hear from God, and I know that's what God wants for me, then I know I'm doing what the right thing is. And I want God's blessing. So today we're just talking and sharing about how to know if it's God. Don't we want to know if it's God? Don't you know that when you have to make some of those most important decisions in your life, that it's God? It's not just what you want. It's not what makes you happy. It's what God wants, and God ultimately wants to help make your character who it needs to be. So we're going to talk in a lot of scriptures, and I want to dissect some of these things down, and we just want to talk a little bit. And the first scripture I want to talk about is James chapter 3. James chapter 3. It says this, If you arbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition, such wisdom is of the devil. The wisdom that comes from God is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere. Impartial and sincere. We're going to dissect that down in a few minutes. What you think that you're on the right road may lead to death. Just because you think you're doing what is right it could lead to death. If you are not doing what God wants you to do, it could cause major problems within your right, life. In Proverbs 14, 12, what you think is right may lead to death. A lot of evil gets blamed on God. A lot of bad things get blamed on God. But we live in a broken world. We live in a broken society with broken relationships, with broken bodies and broken culture. And sometimes we hear this all the time, why would God allow that? Why did God do that? And sometimes because of our desire and our will and our decisions, it takes us in the wrong path when we start that decision and ultimately the path that we take ends in death and ends in life. It is not God. God has given to us a free will. We make our decisions based on what we desire. And what we want to do today, that de desire that we have we want to change what I want to what God wants. And God will bless us if we do what he wants and not necessarily just what we want. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Don't believe everything you hear just because someone says it is a message from God. Here's the next word. Test it first to see if it really is. Just because somebody says, God told me to tell you this, or this is what God wants us to do. Really? God, God gets blamed a lot of things. You know, you're on the golf course, you hear God's name a lot. And if God damned everything that somebody said on the golf course, there wouldn't be much left. Just because somebody uses the name God doesn't mean it's from God. The Bible says in 1 John, test it. So I want to give you some tests. I want to give you some tests, seven tests to tell you if you're speaking to God or if God's speaking to you. But you know what? First thing we need to know is, is um, 
that these God's words can, can come, and then Satan, as soon as God gives you something, Satan can come right along beside you and say something, and you can do something very stupid. So just because you hear God, and you know it's from God, right around the corner, you know if God speaks to you, be ready for the other ear, because Satan is going to yell at you. Satan does not want you to hear from God. Um, P Peter, right at the early part of his ministry, uh, Jesus was asking Peter, who do men say that I am? And, they, and Peter, said, Peter said, you are the son of the living God, the Messiah. You are from God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that, but my father revealed that to you. And then Peter started talking, and Jesus said, he said, hey guys, I must be going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to be put to death. And Peter said, no, 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 no. We're not going to allow that to happen. In the same conversation that Jesus told Peter that God told him he was the Messiah, is the same conversation that Peter said, I won't allow it, and Jesus said, get thee behind me. So God said, yes, you heard me, and in that same conversation, Jesus said, get thee behind me. Because when you do what God wants you to do, there's going to be opposition on every turn. Every turn. It depends who you want to fight. Do you want to fight God's will for your life, or do you want to fight Satan's will for your life? And as children of God, we must stand up and we must do exactly what God has called us to do. In John chapter 7, verse 17, it says, Jesus, anyone who wants to do God's will can test this teaching and know whether it's from God or whether I'm making it up. You can test God's teaching. How do you test God's teaching? How do you test what God wants you to do? The first thing is, does the idea I have agree with the Bible? Does the inclination I have agree with the Bible? He never tells us to disobey the Bible. That's the very first easy test. Does it agree with the Bible? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. My truth is eternal. My word is eternal. My word is absolute truth. I will never change. Is it in harmony with God's word? Um, if, if, if what you desire is not in harmony of God's word, it is not from God. Now, you can talk to God about it. And God, talking to God, he wants to open your eyes. And he wants to give you the idea of how you can look at him and apply. But just be, if we say, I don't care what the Bible says, this is what I want, this is what I desire, what you're saying is no to God and yes to self or yes to the culture. So what we have to do, the first thing you have to do is, does it agree with the word of God? Uh, you, could, you could talk about uh, uh, taxes, the uh, the. A uh, Pharisee came up to him, handed him a coin, and says, what should we do with this coin? Should we pay Caesar? And he looked at the coin, and one, one side was Caesar. He said, pay unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. In other words, pay your taxes. So if, if you don't want to pay your taxes, the Bible says we should pay our taxes. We may do it, you know, not willingly, happily, but we have to pay our taxes. But on the other side, it says, he said, but pay unto God what is God's. Pay unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, but pay unto God what is God's. So the Bible tells us what we should do in a lot of different areas. Now, you may have to look at the Bible, and the Bible doesn't say specific things in every area. It doesn't tell you every action that you should perform or you should not perform. The culture tells us, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. So if the Bible's gray at it, I can do whatever I want. The Bible does say that we have a freedom within our life. But if the Bible tells us no, that means no. But the Bible is not there for a killjoy. The Bible is there for a protective state to make us in harmony. In Romans, it says this, Render unto Caesars the things that are Caesars, and pay unto God the things that are God. Truth will always stand the test of time. Truth. If it was true 5,000 years ago, it'll be true today. The Bible is absolute truth. Um, in Galatians, it says this, in Galatians 1.8, let God's curse fall upon anyone, including myself, who preaches or any other message. Even if an angel comes down from heaven and preaches any other message, let him forever be cursed. There is no other message. There is no other Bible. There is no other testament. 
The word of God is absolute truth. It is finished. The Bible is not enough. You have to add to it or take away from it. It is a curse to do so. So is what you're going through, is what you're believing, what you're thinking, how you're acting, is it compliant to the very word of God? If it is not, I'm saying you're not hearing from God. The second thing, does the idea make me more like Christ? If, if the decision, or if the action, or if the word that I'm getting, if it is making me not like Christ, or be different than Christ, or not act as if Christ, well, then it's not from God. Why does God put us on this earth then? He puts us on this earth for our character to be established. We are here for these 80 years to practice what we're going to be doing for eternity. And we are here to be more like Christ, to be more like him in his culture. In your lives, you must think and act like Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. This is our temporary home. God cares more about your character than he does about your comfort. He wants to teach us how to be like him. So he gives us thoughts. He gives us ideas. He gives us what he wants us to have. We take every thought captive that's obedient to Christ. Every thought. See, you have to process. It says take every thought captive. It's take every thought and give it a test. Why, why am I thinking this? Is this thought good for me? Is this thought of God? Is this thought from Satan? Is this thought because I had a pizza last night at midnight? Why? Why am I thinking this? What do we need to do? We take every thought captive so we can be obedient to Christ. And that's very difficult to do. That's why sometimes when we're talking and we're doing, we get some weird thoughts or we get some issues going on in our minds, we have to say, stop, time out. I, I, I need about 15 seconds. And that's when we just take a break. And we say, Lord, forgive me. I need you protection. I need you to guide me. I need you to think through me. I'm going to stop because a thought came into my mind that was wrong. I apologize and then move on. And when we can do that, we can take every thought captive and test every thought. And then it says this, as we started in James chapter 3, we look at the difference between uh, the devil's thought, thought pattern and God's thought part pattern. And these are some ways that we could take it. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, such wisdom is of the devil. The wisdom that comes from God is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere. Satan, he has three ways. Number one, bitterness. If your first thought pattern is, I want to get even. I don't like you, and I'm going to get even with you. That is not from God. That is Satan. Or envy. I want people to look at me. I want people to think that I am somebody. I want to buy this car or have this dress. I want to do something that, so everybody will look at me, so everybody be jealous of me. I, it's puffed up. If I get puffed up, that's envy. I want people to envy me. That is Satan's thought pattern and not God's thought pattern. And then self-ambition, self-serving ideas, not from God. How can I get people to do things for me? Self-ambition, always looking for self instead of looking for others. That's opposite of what God would have us to do. So Satan's simple three ways. Bitterness, I want to get even. I am mad. And once bitterness gets into our minds, once bitterness gets into our heart, once hatred, unforgiving spirit gets into our hearts, it's very difficult to get over the ability to forgive, the ability to hate. It happens all the time. And then once we get puffed up, once we get prideful, once we get where we think we deserve, once I have what I believe I should have, then that's self-ambition. And Satan is saying, you deserve it. Let people worship you. Get more, have more. Be what you need to be. You deserve to be. And Jesus is saying, okay, that's Satan's way. Now, we don't like, necessarily like God's way because he says this. God's way is pure. So impure thoughts didn't come from God. Impure thoughts don't come from God. When you start thinking you don't like somebody or you're thinking that, he's, that, that he is doing something or she is doing something wrong, it's impure thoughts. Peace-loving promotes harmony and not division. Peace-loving means in everything that I do, I should have the idea of harmony. I should have the idea of peace. I should have the idea, how can I make it better? How can I not say something bad about somebody? 
So under this peace-loving, you ready for this? All gossip is sin. It's none of your business. All gossip is sin. If it is not for you, to you, about you, it's not you. We should say, you know what, go talk to them about that. Because sometimes in the internet, on Facebook, just because one person says one thing, everybody believes what one person says, and it is not necessarily true. If something is taken out of context, if somebody says something that the investigators are taking a look at and they're looking at every issue and then somebody throws up on Facebook, it could cause major havoc to an individual's life. Let the authorities take care of the issues. Let God take care of the church. What we need to do is we need to not gossip. We need to have pure thoughts and peace-loving thoughts. And then be considerate, thinking of others more than yourself. Be considerate. When, when, when you're thinking, of, is this from God? If it's from God, I should always be thinking of somebody else. Not what I can get out of this, but what I can do for somebody else. And then submissive. Humble, teachable, and you can check by others. If it's submissive. In other words, submissive means I, I, it's not about me. God isn't necessarily going to give me a word for me to do so I can be puffed up. God is going to give me the word so I can serve somebody else. So I could be submissive. It means just, can I be humble? See, the Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does that mean? That means if, if, if everything that I'm trying to do is for me to be puffed up, for me to look good, or for me to have something, God cannot use something that he will not bless. And this is good when it's talked about submissive. That means, that means you can just get checked. That means if, if God is speaking to you and... and uh, he's trying to get you to do something, or he thinks that you may try to do something, you can say, hey, Kevin, can I talk to you about something? This is kind of what I'm thinking. I just need to make sure that I'm on the same page. What do you, what do you think? And being submissive, it's not, I'm not afraid of what you would think. I'm just telling you this is what God is trying to get me to do. Do you think that that's pretty cool? And you find men and women that are of God, that wants God's will, and check it out. Talk to them about it. Full of mercy. Full of mercy. This is, a, this is a big one. If God is speaking to you, is it full of mercy? It makes me more forgiving from you to others. It takes no intelligence to criticize. We can always solve somebody else's problems, but can we solve our own problems? It takes a humble heart to be the spirit of encourager. But when we have the lack of forgiveness, God cannot ask you to do something until we first take care of our own issues it's an impartial and sincere. Don't use what you hear from God to manipulate and to hurt anyone else. So God wants us to have certain ways. The first thing is God's word. He wants us to look at God's word. And then, does it make me more like Christ? Does it make me, and we know what Christ is like because Christ is one that he wants us to have a loving heart. And then the third thing is, does my church family think this is a good idea? Does my church family think it's a good idea? Now, this is where I believe small groups are perfect. Because small groups are groups of 10 to 15 individuals. You get together with a small group and, and you have an issue. You're not going to stand up in church on that side over here and say, hey, I got an idea. What about this? You're not going to talk like that. But in a small group, when a major issue is going on with your life and you have something that you just need to speak and God is speaking to you, you can sit in a group of uh, 10 individuals and you can say, hey, let me tell you what's going on in my life. And I think this is what God is asking me to do. And then the leaders, those godly men and women that are sitting around in that small group can say, yeah, but. And they can say, yeah, but we can pray for you. Small group, when somebody's going through a divorce or somebody has a major calamity in their life, that small group comes alongside them, loves them and helps them and encourages them. Small groups are a major key to keep the unity of the body of Christ. But in that small group with those godly men and women, it's a place where you can talk and you can get affirmed whether God is speaking to you positively or negatively. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 it says, God's intent is that, the, that through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Through the wisdom of the church God's wisdom will be known. If God is genuinely speaking to you others will confirm it. Others will agree with you. And if you resist telling everybody else what you're thinking it's probably a red flag. If you're afraid you say man is God talking to me about this? 
talk to the spiritual leaders within your church and within your small group. Um, uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9, it says, The wisdom of the righteous can save you. The wisdom of the righteous can save you. That, that means God's will can be spoken to you, but if you don't know exactly if it's God or the flesh or, or the devil, speak to godly people. What can save it from you? Waste time in your life, your mistakes, even pain, and even some embarrassment. The righteous man is important. The Bible says the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Praying to God for others avails much. We need a small group sometimes. Whenever you think you don't have time to hassle with it, think about the calamity within your life. I do, I, I do a lot of funerals, and uh, funerals are tough. But you know what? When I see a family with a church, or when I see a family with a small group and they're going through that, and, and I meet with the family, there's a group of people in there, and, and it's tender because they've shared life together. Their families together. Their churches around them. They can talk. Small group, when somebody's going through a calamity, when they go through it, they don't have to go through it alone. In the multitude of counselors, there are safety. And that's what, when we talk to the church, we talk to people, make sure God is with you. And then, number four, is my idea consistent with God, how, how God made me? We've been talking the last couple of weeks about how God made you. How God shaped you. Um, the Bible says we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I thought about this all week. I've been watching Michael Phelps. Anybody been watching Michael? I mean, you know what they need to do? They need to put a normal person in the pool to swim beside Michael Phelps. Because that dude is fast. I'd I like to see how much faster he is than the normal person getting in the pool. But anyway, I made a major decision this week. I am resigning as your pastor. And for the next four years, I'm going to prepare to be the my, next Michael Phelps. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I can do it. I think I, can, I think I can lose about 150 pounds. And I think I can learn to dog paddle. I'm not shaped or skilled to be an Olympic swimmer. So I may desire that. In my dreams, I may dream like Michael Phelps, but once I dove in the water, I'm not Michael Phelps. I'm not shaped like Michael Phelps. I can't do what Michael Phelps does. So when we say, you can do anything that you want, yeah, you can do anything that you want. You just can't be successful at everything that you want, right? Because we are shaped by God. Now, what's the shape? S, spiritual gifts. Are you spiritually gifted to do what God is asking you to do? Do you have the heart to do what God is asking you to do? Do you have the abilities to do what God wants you to do? Do you have the personality to do what God wants you to do? And do you have the experience to do what God wants you to do? Is it a talent? If God has given to you a talent, he wants you to serve others with that talent. If God has given you abilities, he wants you to serve others with those abilities. Whatever it needs to be done. With our church, God's not going to say, I want you to do this because I've already asked you to do this. And if God has asked you to do this and you say, nope, that's not what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't expect to hear from God. Because God wants you to do and be faithful in the little things. And God says, if you do the little things, I will grow you to do the great things. But if you're not willing to do the little things, how can I give you responsibility for the greater things? God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. But he also understands if we have do certain things well, the opposites, and you take a personality chart, you may be an A in one area, but you're way down here in the other area. I may be way outgoing, but on the bottom side, I could get very depressed. If I'm strong up here, I've got some way negatives down here. We took our leadership uh, thing, um, our legal, uh, leadership chart, and I was uh, outgoing type A leadership, okay? But that was up here. But my communication skills, I'm a bottom line communicator. 
Okay, which means I tell you once, I expect you to get it, and if you don't get it, you're in trouble. Well, half of my staff, they're, they, like, they like just to talk. I said, I don't want to talk about it. Do it. Well, I don't know what you, here, do this, this, and this, and it'll get done. Let me know when you get it done. They're sitting there, what? They're afraid that, bottom line, just get it done. You know, just because you're here doesn't mean everybody can relate to you. You have to bring who we are down so God can use you in certain areas of our life. And we have to do that. You can't do anything you want, but you can do what God wants. You may not be able to do everything you want, but there's one thing that you can do. You can do what God wants you to do. God will empower you, and he will gift you to do what he wants you to do. So you're hearing God's word. Does my idea concern my responsibility? I want to park here for a second. I'm going to tell you, and if you say this, I apologize. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it anyway. I believe if God wants to talk to you, God's going to talk to you. I don't believe God's going to talk to me about you. And I don't believe I have the right to go up and tell you what God told me to tell you. I'm not a priest where God has to speak to me to talk to you. If God wants to talk to you, God will talk to you. Now, he may use me to talk to you, but I won't know that I'm talking to you. It'll be a sermon. It'll be something that I said that God speaks to you. But for me to go up to you and say, Spencer, God told me what your secret sin is. And I want you to know right now, I know all about it. You know what God's going to do? He can say, Bruce, shut up. <laughs> if I want to talk to Spencer, I'll talk to Spencer. Now, if he does reveal something to you and you have a heart, God may give you an inclination. God may give you an idea that, hey, Spencer needs you. Why don't you, why don't you go talk to him? And through that, confirmation of being able to talk and be able to share we can do that and Spencer may need me and at that time Spencer can understand that I'm there to pray with him but if if if, you, if I don't like you and if you don't like me don't believe God's going to tell you what I'm doing wrong and God's going to tell me what you're doing wrong all that is causes division and he is not the author of confusion if God wants to speak to you God will speak to you if we desire God's will, God will speak. So if somebody says, God told me to tell me this, okay, you know what? Time out. I'm glad he did. Let me talk to him first. And let me see if he'll tell me. Then I'll find out what he wants to talk to you about. But God wants to speak to us individually. Um, Jesus says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Uh, Jesus was talking to, to Peter, and, and he said, he said, you are going to, you're going to be crucified. You're going to be beaten. Because you're following me, you are going to be tortured. And Peter goes, well, what about John? He goes, if I'm going to be tortured, if I'm going to be beaten, what about John? And Jesus said, listen, Peter, it's not about you. It doesn't bother you. I will tell John what John needs to know you, this is what I tell you, if he's going to be alive till I come back, it's nothing to you. What we must do is we must have to worry about ourselves and not about everybody else. Jesus said, dude, don't worry about John. I'll talk to John. You worry about yourself. Sometimes um, we need to have a couple guidelines when God speaks to you about someone else. The first thing, if you think God is speaking to you about somebody else, and sometimes he does, be patient and pray. It's not a gossip session. Don't gossip or talk to that person. Pray that they will receive his message in a way that you can pray for them to help them, not to criticize them. And sometimes when we get this inclination, we think it's our job to tell everybody about what God is doing. Well, God wants to work through the humbled spirit of a pastor or of a servant. So what we do is we don't tell everybody we pray. We pray and we seek God's face. Because when God speaks to us through our heart, through our inclinations, and through our heart, it's always to help and to save and to serve. It's not necessarily to let them know. Um, and God usually t speaks through you without you even knowing about it. In a small group or in a Sunday school class or in a church setting or through a song, you're seeing and you're preaching and you're teaching and I say something, I read something 
And you're saying, wow, that's what I was just thinking about last night. Or that's what we talked about. Is, is Bruce reading our mail? Now, see, I'm not even reading the emails you sent me. I'm not going to read your mail. So, no. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I wanted Bruce to say this. And this was for you. When you come to church, you come to church to hear from God. You come to church to worship his name. We don't come to church just to learn the Bible, which is great that we do. We go to church so God can use the word of God to speak to our hearts. To That was from God. That's exactly what I needed. That's exactly what I'm going through. God usually uses us, and we don't even know he has done it. And you come up to me afterwards, and you say, man, um, that was awesome. My wife and I, we did this, or my son's going through this, and this is exactly what we're going through. And, and when you said that, and I, I said, I didn't even know I said that. I, that. That wasn't even in my sermon notes. And you're saying, well, that's what God used. In, Revela in Romans chapter 14, it says, we will be judged one day, not by each other's standards, or even our own, but the judgment of God. It is not God alone that we shall have to answer for. It is God alone that we have to stand and answer for our actions. It's not about pleasing you. It's about honoring God. So when we do that, number five was, does my ideas concern my responsibility? If, if God is speaking to me, it's for me and my responsibility. It's not necessarily for everybody else. Okay? Now, number six is where you camp. Most of us camp on number six. Is my idea convicting or condemning? Convicting or condemning? Let me, under, let me teach you this. Conviction comes from God, and it is to correct us. Condemnation comes from Satan, and it is to criticize us. Conviction comes from God, and it is to correct us. Condemnation comes from Satan, and it is to criticize us. Um, and when you are condemned, it leaves you feeling useless and worthless. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. God never attacks your value. Your sin, yes, but he never devalues you. What the conviction is for is for correction. And your father loves you, and you know he loves you because he disciplines you. And that's how we get convicted. When we sin, when, when we've had that overwhelming, ah, I goofed up, I was wrong, that's the Holy Spirit inside you just wrenching your soul because God isn't pleased because you sinned, because you said something. Have you ever said something to somebody and you just wish you wouldn't have done it? And you say, ah, man, that was stupid. Go apologize now. And once you apologize, you know that conviction? It's gone. Because conviction is not condemnation. Once we understand, I've done something wrong, I've done something against God, and he convicted me of it because he knows what I've done, and you say, okay, I admit, I'm wrong, sorry, I'm going to repent. I apologize, I ask for forgiveness. That conviction instantaneously is lifted because you're not guilty of it anymore. Consequences, yeah, but not the issue. And that conviction is lifted. Now, that condemnation of Satan, you are worthless. If you were a Christian, you'd have never said that. If God, oh, God can't even love you for that. Condemnation. And that condemnation stays on you and stays on you and stays on you until the point that we feel devalued and worthless and I don't know what to do. That is condemnation. And condemnation is from who? Satan. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There is conviction because of correction. And what we have to do, are you listening to Jesus and that Jesus will be conviction? Or are we listening to Satan and that will be condemnation? Who are you listening to? And you have to say, if it is condemnation, we feel devalued. We feel like we're not worthy. We have to stand up, put our face up, and say, get thee behind me, Satan. I am not going to allow you to devalue me any longer. We have to stand for that. Condemnation is general and it's vague. Conviction is clear and it goes away. Clear and goes away. In a court of law, you stand and the evidence comes against you. And if you are found guilty, you are convicted. Whatever you're convicted of, the judge 
or the jury will say guilty. At that time, you're guilty. And then there's another phase called the penalty phase. And that's the condemnation phase. That's why you are going to be condemned for prison, whether it's a year, five years, or life. The difference between our court system and the church court system is we can be convicted. And that's when Jesus says, you're guilty. And you say, yes, Lord, I'm guilty. And Jesus says, forgiven. There's no condemnation in you because I took your punishment. I am your savior. So when we are condemned, it has to be from Satan because Jesus took our condemnation and nailed it on the cross. And we are free because we are convicted. We have done something wrong. But God said, I love you so much. I'm not allowing you to hold your own condemnation. But, J but Satan can't stand that. The worst day of Satan's life is when Jesus died on the cross. Because all the sin of the entire world, the condemnation of all of our sin was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus can stand up and say, I am not going to condemn you. I came to save you. The guilt, the fear, the pain, the agony, the temptation, yeah, they're real. And you may be guilty, but all I ask you to do is repent. Repent and turn away. When I convict you, the Holy Spirit convicts you, agree with God and turn away, and I will forgive because I've already paid for that sin. Satan is the accuser of the brother. Satan is in heaven right now, walking to and fro, accusing you of your sin, saying, yeah, but you see this, or yeah, but why did he do this? Why is that taking place? And Jesus said, you know, you're right. Those things are taking place. And, and Satan is saying, why don't, why don't you pay them back? Why don't you punish them? And Jesus is saying, they're free. They're innocent. They're my children. I love them. I've already paid for them. They are mine. I don't have to pay them back. I can convict them. I can encourage them. I can discipline them. But I am not going to devalue them. I'm going to love them through what they're going through. I'm going to test them. And I'm going to make sure they come out on the other side. And, and Satan is saying, they are worthless. And Jesus said, no, they are priceless. They are mine. So wherever you are, if you're living a life that needs conviction... And you know that you are being convicted every day by the Holy Spirit of God. Praise God that you're saved because that conviction will never go away. But if you're not a believer of Jesus Christ and you're living under the condemnation, under Satan's influence, you can't get under, you cannot get from, out from under that condemnation until you get under the blood of Jesus Christ. That condemnation is belittling, hurtful, and terrible because it's real. And the only way that we can get rid of that condemnation is go to Jesus. And Jesus wipes away all the condemnation. Now what we have to do, and what we do a lot, is we stay in the condemnation phase. We are forgiven children of God. We have Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and he's been nailed to the cross, and we accept Jesus. But we believe the voice of Satan saying, no, done too much. Not good enough. Why would he do that for you? Why? And you say, I don't know why. I'm nobody. But Jesus loves me. This I know. And I know one day that he stood on that hill and his arms stretched out wide and he died on that cross and he shed his blood and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me from all of my sins. So Satan, shut up. Get behind me. Jesus is my Lord. And that condemnation that you've been hearing, that you've been living on, that you believe is a lie from hell. And you have to accept it. You have to believe it. You have to put it in the back and say, no more am I going to listen to the condemnation of Satan. I'm going to listen to the conviction of Jesus and live on God's love and not Satan's wrath. And do I sense a peace about my idea? Do I sense a peace about it? See, God is love, and God is peace. When we feel 
what God wants us to do. God is not going to do something that's going to cause confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Are you feeling pressured or overwhelmed or confused? If you're caught up in what I can't do, instead of being caught up on what I can do. We were created out of our own confusion. He has a plan for us. We are the ones messing it up. Satan makes you worry that you can't do what God wants you to do. I'm not good enough. I can't sing well enough. I'm not talented enough. And God says, it's not about your talents. It's about your heart. It's about what I want to do through you. Oh, it may take some training. It may take some work. But don't listen to Satan to say that you can't. Listen to me that says I can. When I do things, what God wants me to do. God is compassionate about you. He's compassionate and he wants you to do great things. And he wants you to trust in him. And I like in, in Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. He says, pray about everything. If you're anxious about what God is trying to get you to talk about, pray about it. Don't go overboard. Don't get stressed out about it. Calm down. Don't worry. Because God is going to allow you to do what he's gifted, what he's shaped you, what he's given you to do. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, pray. Listen to wise advice. Follow it closely. And you can pass this on to others about your struggles, about your fears, and about your cares. If you can't hear him anymore, and you don't think... He's talking to you. Maybe you need to look at your life. If you want him to talk, if you want that inclination from God, start looking. Start listening. It's kind of, I like to fly. I love, I love flying. And uh, you get on this plane on this runway, it takes off, and I love going fast, and you get up in the clouds. And going through the clouds, it kind of has some turbulence. And that's what our prayer life is like. We get on our knees and we pray. And we get through some of the turbulence. And then we get through the clouds. And they're flying high above the clouds. And you can see this beautiful blue sky. And you stay in that prayer time. In that time of con. And you're communicating to God. And it's just a beautiful time. And you get ready to land. And you go through that turbulence. And you go through the clouds. And that landing sometimes can be rough. But in every one of our lives... There's turbulent times. And in turbulent times is we do one or two things. Number one, we run to God. Or we run away from God. Because we run away from God because we don't want God to tell us what to do. We don't like what he has for us to do. So we say, you know what, I don't want God. We have an issue within our families. We have an issue within our life. We say, you know what, I got this on my own. I got this one. And God is saying, I got this one. If you give this one to me, I can take care of this one. So we hold on to our own opinions. We listen to the condemnation of Satan. And Jesus is sitting and he's saying this, I want to give to you. I want to give to you what you need. I want to give to you the word. I want to give to you peace. I want to give to you what you absolutely need but you can't listen to both. It's confusion. And he says, I am not the author of confusion. You can't listen to Satan in one ear and act as if Satan is condemning you and then come to church on Sunday and play the churchianity and put Jesus in this ear and you act good in church on Sunday morning. Churchianity is of Satan. It's Christianity. It's Christ-like followers. Not church goers. Church goers won't do anything. It's when you get on your knees before God and say no to Satan, no to condemnation, yes to the conviction, and say yes to God. And when we do that, we can have the peace of God. If you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're done, you're listening to the wrong voice. 
the right voice, the humbled voice. The Bible says, fall on our knees before him, out of conviction, being humbled, cry out to God, and he will wrap his arms around you, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, and he wants to take you and make you who he wants you to be. But if he's listening, and you're hearing the wrong voice, you hear the condemnation, the fears, you're worthless. You'll never make it. You're listening to the wrong person. And we listen to the wrong person long enough. We get used to his voice. We get so used to his voice, we like his voice. We have to change who we listen to. The Bible said the sheep know my voice. So what we have to do is we have to close the ear. We have to close the door. Stop listening to the condemnation of Satan. And go to the other side and say, Lord, teach me your voice. Teach me your ways. And Jesus is saying, just humble. Humble yourself towards me. I didn't want you to come to church to learn the Bible. I want you to come to church to love me. And if you love me, you're going to listen to the word. You're going to learn the word because you love me. Not because it's time to go to church. It's because I want to radically change your life. I want to radically let you listen to me. So when you're listening to the wrong voice, you'll never do what God wants you to do. Never. And if you listen to what God wants you to do, you don't understand that voice because you understand you're under the love of God and not under the condemnation of Satan. The invitation is very simple. What voice are you listening to? Do you hear the voice of God? Has it been a while since you've heard the heart of God? Do you want God to get rid of the fear and the anxiety and the stress within your life? Come to God in prayer. There'll be deacons here alongside you to just pray over you. If you're tired of the condemnation, you're tired of the feeling of being worthless, you're tired of the feeling of not being worthy, you're tired of not doing what God wants you to do or not even hearing what God wants you to do, the Bible says God gives grace to the humble. It's not about you. It's about allowing God to be heard by you. God speaks, we listen, then we do. So if you're hurting, if you want to hear from God, put yourself in a position where you can hear what God wants you to do. Be humble. Come and pray. Seek God's face. And he will lift up his arms towards you. And he will shout at the rooftops. And he will clean your heart and make you who he needs you to be. Let's go to